Hello and welcome to our Introducing Assessment for Learning question and answer session. Um, we always find these as educators really valuable. It gives us an opportunity to see what you've been learning throughout the course uh, and that responsiveness that obviously is something that's really important to our Assessment for Learning course in particular uh, and the suite of courses that accompany it. So thank you to those of you who have put questions in for us. It gives us a chance to think uh, and give more personalised response. And thank you to the National STEM Learning Centre, as always, for this opportunity. So without further ado, I will move on and look at the questions that have been written. So I've categorised these under different themes um, that link to what we've been focusing on in terms of learning objectives for the course that you've engaged with. So the first few questions I've put under the heading of improving decision-driven data collection. So that's something obviously we've looked at a lot in the course. It's this idea that, um, that as teachers, when we're teaching our students and we've got a curriculum to get through, that as we build our knowledge of the curriculum, we start to identify where there are key points where we need to be gathering evidence of our students' thinking. And it's at these points then um, that Dylan talks in particular about how we need to improve the quality of the evidence we collect so that data informs our thinking and we can then respond and teach our students better. So the first question I've got is come from a couple of people. So this is Tasha and Savita. And this question talks about how can I collect answers from more students? Absolutely. And dig deeper into the wrong answers that our individual students make without it taking a very long time. Yeah, it's that dichotomy, isn't it, of of spending the time wisely to enhance everybody's learning or am I hindering the rest of the group moving on? And I think that's one of our professional decisions that we make all the time as teachers. Do, do I need to stop and you know unpick this thinking with everybody or do I need to move it forward? And I think there's lots of strategies and, and, and deeper things that come from this question. So thank you, Tasha and Savita. Uh, in terms of collecting answers from more students, um, the strategies that we showed on the course, I know on our other course planning for learning as well, we go into some uh, additional regularly talked about strategies that help us gather evidence from more students. Uh, it's doing the things like um, there's lots of different ways we can do this. It's gathering evidence using mini whiteboards. It's ensuring that every child feels confident to participate. It's maybe getting our students talking. The evidence doesn't always have to be gathered uh, in a whole class feedback situation where I'm at the front and the teachers are, uh, are sending stuff back to me. So I might gather evidence actually as my students are talking to each other and I'm walking around. I know that I keep in my hand, um, I generally have either a mini whiteboard or a post-it note. And as they're talking, I walk around and I'm actively listening to what the groups are saying to each other. And that helps me gather evidence from more students and also um, helps me identify where I might want to dig deeper in terms of developing the conceptual understanding of all the class, uh, which was the second part of the question. Uh, you know, we've talked about on the course, we've highlighted strategies such as hinge point questions. So for me, a hinge point question, which is a very um, difficultly crafted question because I need to write it knowing what that troublesome knowledge is for my students. Uh, the children that I'm teaching and I need to craft it so that every response on there tells me something about their thinking and this is the problem isn't it sometimes pupils will be thinking things that I can't account for so how do I gather that evidence too so hinge point questions that are well crafted are something that will help me um, and then that digging deeper I would be wanting to make sure that all of the students if it's something that I want to find out more about their thinking that I will probe them and so you know I build a classroom culture where I say to my students don't be afraid if I keep asking you questions and, and, and making you dig deeper into your understanding it's actually going to help us all learn and sometimes I'll do that with the pupils one-on-one -on -one, or maybe with a small group of pupils who are working together and I'll be asking questions I've heard something that I think is interesting and I might go and work with that group of pupils if as I've been circulating uh, or I've used a hinge point question and many of them have got some of the wrong ideas that I want to dig deeper or they've got thinking that I think will help develop others because they're starting to move conceptually in the right way. I will dig deeper publicly. So it's about professional judgment for me. It's what way is going to help me um, elicit the evidence that's going to be best quality. So hinge point questions, as I say, there's other ideas in planning for learning. We look at things like think, pair, share that help our students talk for longer and get more evidence out. Uh, but there's lots of strategies that can help me do that. And then 
I make that professional decision. Is it just this group of pupils I need to focus in on? Is it just this one pupil I need to focus in on? Is it the whole class I need to stop and have that discussion with? Um, and I will spend that time then reflecting and responding accordingly. I know one of the things I like to do is if I find out that there are just a small number of pupils who have got thinking in a particular way that maybe needs some more support and scaffolding from me, then I will offer an opportunity to have a drop in with me. Uh, I know that primary do this really well. So children will be working on the tables and the teacher might run a drop in clinic on the carpet. And so I will run a drop in clinic. But what I like to do is open it up to anybody. So not just so I might have been walking around and think I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. But then I would say anybody else who's feeling less confident about this idea and needs to come and talk, come to the drop in clinic too. So lots of different ways there, uh, Tasha and Sabita, I hope. But as you say, it's that constantly thinking about how can I be get the best quality evidence, that decision-driven data collection, how then do I respond to that? And digging deeper to find out my students' thinking will help me with it. So thank you very much for that. So moving on then to our next question. Again, Tasha's asked uh, questions which I think um, link very nicely to the, the first question that Tasha and Sabita asked. So Tash is asking, while I'm doing the above, gathering the evidence, how can I assure that the other students are still engaged and paying attention or better still contributing to the chat between me and the student exploring his or her answer? So I think we've, we've covered some ideas, Tasha, in the first bit that I talked about there, which I hope will help with that. Um, other ideas I thought about were, were our pose, pause, pounce and bounce. Now, this is something that we look at on our planning for learning course. The idea is that I will pose a question. So you're gathering your evidence and then you might pause and in that pause time you can do various different things i know when i i pause for my students to encourage everybody to talk encourage all of them to contribute to get them to see that i value all of their thinking i, I might do something like um, a think pair share at that point or i might get them to do a write think pair share so they write down their ideas and thoughts and then they talk to each other about what their thinking is and then i'm going to pounce across the classroom and start bouncing students' ideas. I know that Chris has talked previously on one of our question and answer sessions, and I do this often as a strategy with teaching, is that I gather ideas and I scoop them from a group and they talk about their thinking, then I scoop them from another group, but it needs to be purposeful so that it's, a, it's using an open question or something that helps get them to elucidate more of their understanding um, so that actually as I'm scooping their ideas from each group, they start learning from what the others have said and it ends up that they can teach each other without me having to do any input at all if I pose the question appropriately and I give them a chance to uh, articulate their thoughts and they that's a really powerful activity to get students to learn but again I wouldn't be doing it every lesson it's about something that's important or a particular troublesome part of the of the topic so it is that professional um, reflection again of me is this useful for everybody do I need to move on do I need to move some of the class on do I need them to discuss things Things together um, and you know do I need to work with a small individual group do I need to get somebody who's understood the idea to do a drop-in clinic with a small individual group and again that's something that I will do I'll get the peers working effectively as learning resources for each other so I think there's lots of different things to think about if I'm picking up those subtle signals that the students are disengaging then I need to respond to that and do something about it um, but it is important that we get this effective dialogue going you know, the research evidence says that as teachers, we ask a lot of questions. Um, and I see my trainee teachers often, you know, it's it's something that we start out doing. We can stand at the front because it's safer. And we fill a lot of the lesson time with whole class question and answering. And it goes back to that decision driven data collection that, that Dylan talks about. If the question isn't worth asking, if I'm not getting that valid evidence, is that the best use of the learning time for my for my pupils? So I need to think about that all the time. What's the best use of the time for them? And the more I can get them learning collectively from each other, the research says the more they are going to start constructing their own understanding and meaning. So for me, it is that I would, I would only be wanting that whole group, that whole class discussion when it's worthwhile for the whole class. Um, if not, then get them doing other things. It might be that I'm doing some directive teaching at that point, or it might be actually that they're working in groups and then I'm actually intervening with different groups. Um, so thank you, Tasha, for that. Moving on, Tasha then asks another question, which I've put under the same heading. I'm not entirely sure I understand the difference between intentional dialogue, which is something we've focused very much on, on in the course, versus an interactive dialogic classroom. What's that? So in terms of the intentional dialogue, I know it's something that Chris has talked about a lot on the course. It is 
linked to the idea that Dylan talks about, about me eliciting evidence that is meaningful. You know, a learning classroom is a talking classroom. Learning is something, it's very difficult to evidence, you know, how can, you know, can we guarantee that what our students are doing is learning? We get them to perform and we have outcomes, but is that learning? You know, that's a really deep question to think about. In terms of intentional dialogue, it's about me as a teacher wanting to find out what is going on inside their heads. So I'm planning to get what's going on inside here out so that I can respond better. I can recognise, I can infer, I can notice. And the more I develop my understanding about learning and my curriculum that I teach, the more I can respond to the evidence I'm eliciting from my students about their thinking. So that's, you know, the language that they're telling me. So some of my students yesterday, they were saying that when something, you know, two objects fall on earth, they fall at the same speed. I know because I've, you know, I've, I've worked and struggled and understand how we learn physics. That's the wrong language. They don't fall at the same speed. They accelerate at the same rate. Slightly different language. So it's inferring to me, have they fully understood what I'm talking about? So in that way, I will plan my intentional dialogue. I put difficulties in. I put hinge point questions in. I put uh, concept cartoons in. I put, um, you know, lots of different strategies that would be exemplified on the course and people have been sharing in the comments. I'll put particular things in. I'll put some mocked up work that's wrong to get my students talking so I can find out what's going on in their thinking. So that's our intentional dialogue. It's that planned for dialogue. It involves me listening. And one of the big things I know both Dylan and Chris have said that assessment for learning is about making the, the pupils' voices louder and the teachers' hearing better. And it is about me listening then because I've planned for this point in their learning sequence. It's about the pupils being able to air their thinking in a safe environment. It's about all pupils inputting their voice so I can find out what everybody's thinking. It's about that troublesome knowledge. So it's not about the facts. You know, I might do lots of different ways of getting kids to uh, assimilate facts. There's lots of cognitive strategies that help them with that. But then it's about me listening, noticing, recognising and responding to what I'm inferring. That is intentional dialogue for me. And I think that's what we were trying to get across in the course. In terms of interactive dialogic classroom, that intentional dialogue would be part of this. Um, I've got here my little book, which I'm sure we reference. This is Towards Dialogic Teaching. And I would say uh, Robin Alexander and Neil Mercer are uh, the people I would read who, who go into this much more. They're kind of like the, the experts in this area in terms of dialogic. And in dialogic classrooms, um, Alexander talks about there's five key pillars five key principles that underpin what the teacher would be doing. Um, and these include the idea that dialogic teaching is collective in the fact that both teachers and pupils address the learning together, whether that's as a group, so the teacher working with the students and talking about the learning, uh, or as a class. And there is a difference between learning and task performance. And we unpick that very much on our feedback for learning course. Uh, in dialogic classrooms, the teaching is reciprocal. So we are listening to each other. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a positive learning environment where, where children learn that listening to each other's contributions is valuable for their learning if we plan for those key points where they do that. So it's really important that we encourage that they share ideas, that we get the alternative viewpoints out, that we air those, because that's where we're really going to unpick the learning boundaries and push forward our children's understanding. That dialogic teaching is supportive, um, so there's no fear of embarrassment, there's no such thing about a wrong answer, it's where I'm currently at in my understanding. Where I'm at in my understanding is where I can help move you forward. Uh, there's a beautiful little quote I came across, I think it was Sadler, he said, oh no it wasn't, it was um, Torrance, he said that where, where we can get in, that's the crack, where the, where the light gets in, that's the learning boundary where we can push forward our, our children's learning horizon. Our dialogic teachings then, our fourth principle is that they're cumulative, so we get teachers and children building on each other's ideas and we chain them together in this coherent thinking. So it would be less of the, the triadic interactions where the teacher initiates, a pupil responds, the teacher either evaluates or gives feedback. And research says that often most interactions in the classroom are in that triadic approach, one, two, three. I initiate, you respond, I evaluate or give feedback. Where actually in our dialogic classrooms, we've got those chains of interactions. I initiate, a child responds, I probe. 
Maybe that child responds, I probe. Maybe another child responds. And we get the IP, RP, RP, respond, probe, respond, probe. All the time, we're all learning from the dialogue that's going on. And finally, dialogic teaching is purposeful. So it's all about moving towards the educational goals. It's all about moving towards the consolidation of that understanding. Um, so dialogic teaching for me involves that intentional dialogue, but they are slightly different. So I hope, Tasha, that helps. But as I say, if you want to read more, I would recommend going and having a look at Robin Alexander or Neil Mercer's work on dialogic teaching. OK, thank you very much for those questions. Um, I'm going to move now on to... Uh, a question that was raised from both Sophia and John, and this is a question that they say that they've, they've, they've done the course and they still have um, linked to hinge point questions in particular. But it's that idea, um, how soon after using a, a hinge point question should I give out the correct answer? Is it worth waiting until the follow up tasks have been completed so I can ask the hinge, question, hinge point question a second time to check if understanding has improved? When do you let them know the correct answer or do you wait until they've worked it out for themselves as you revisit the topic? Uh, a really interesting question there, Sophia and John. Um, again, no right or wrong answer. It comes down to your classroom culture and the way that you perceive learners within it. For me, I like to teach so that my students, my children um, can construct their own understanding and actually be able to tell me at some point later which the right answer is and why, and which the wrong answers are and why. Um, because as we've said, hinge point questions are, are difficult to write because every answer counts. So it's either right answers for the right thinking or wrong answers for the wrong thinking. But all of them are telling me about your thinking. So they're written about that troublesome knowledge. So for me, I would respond to my hinge point question um, Again, and I would plan for it depending on how many of the children had the right thinking and how many of my pupils had the wrong thinking or not the wrong thinking, were thinking conceptually in a different way to what the, 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 the conceptual understanding is because it's the way they think, isn't it, at the time. And then I would respond in lots of different ways. Um, often because I teach science, I will go from a hinge point question into something practical. Uh, and actually get the pupils to apply learning. And I would think about the groups that I get my pupils in as a consequence of the hinge point question. So I might regroup my pupils uh, in light of their responses to the hinge point question. So I might mix those who have got a strong understanding with those who've got a weaker understanding so that together through the activities I get them to work through, a practical activity, I might have structured questions that I then make them think about and that they then come to me. Uh, and I will often have a help desk going while I'm doing, and these some ideas we look at on other courses, I'll have a help desk going whilst they're working through practical work that I will sit on and they have to come to me when they've gone through three of the questions that I've given them as question prompts. And at that point, I will check how their conceptual understanding is developing in terms of the idea. Um, if I use a hinge point question towards the end of a topic and I ask and all the class have got it wrong, then I may respond and think, right, OK, I've taught it one way and it's not worked. I need to replan and teach this learning concept again in a different way. And I have done that. I thought I've taught things really well and I've done a hinge point question and it's just everybody's got the wrong thinking. So I've had to go away and replan. Uh, if it's if it's a threshold concept, something I need them to know, I may reteach it next lesson. If it's something I think we can wait till later down the line because the curriculum spirals and develops, then I might teach it later down the line. Uh, if I find that half of my class have got it, half haven't, quite often I will plan for them to have a discussion with a stimulating question, uh, a stimulus question that will get them talking. Or if there's just a small number, then sometimes I move everybody on, I do a drop-in clinic with them, or I move everybody on and I will note those those pupils and come back to them at some other point. What I generally tend to do then is not give the right answer, but develop their learning so that they can justify to me what the right answer is at a time in the future. But as I say, that's my way of, of teaching and approaching it in my classroom. What I love when I do my student voice and I ask them what's helped you learn across this topic, they will say things to me like, we know when you give us one of those questions, and they mean the hinge point questions, we know you do it because you know we're going to get it wrong, but we love it when we come back to it later and we can explain why and why the others are, are, the, are the right, why it's the right answer and why the others are the wrong answer. And that for me, I think, is a, a triumph of learning when they can justify the reasoning behind the different answers. 
So for me, it's not about the answer. It is about that process, you know, that processing knowledge and understanding that they need to develop so they can reason why the answers are correct and why the other answers are wrong. So that's the way I use them. Um, But I know we're all different. And one of the things I would say is we are professionals. You know, Chris Dillon and I write these courses based on research evidence. Um, but you have to go away and test them and try them out with your students. So I would say try them out and ask the students what's helping you learn, what's helping you develop your understanding, not what's helping you perform, but what's helping you actually grasp the concepts that I'm teaching you. And I would have that dialogue going in my classroom. So hopefully um, that gives you some ideas, Sophia and John. And as I say, try them out with your pupils and get some feedback from them. And, you know, one of the things we do on all our courses is give you some question stem prompts for you to use, adapt, that might help you gather that evidence from your pupils about what's helping their learning. So do feel free to go back and look in week three and pick up some of those prompts or develop your own link to this idea. But ask them, does it help your understanding if I give you the answer and see what they say? See what they say. Okay, thank you very much. So moving on now to um, some questions that have been asked. Again, um, I've grouped this under the title of engaging all age groups of pupils because our pupils, on, you know, our uh, for you as participants on the course, our pupils range from very young children. So we have, you know, teachers teaching children down in reception and early years to teachers teaching pupils who are, Um, in HE and FE. So we've got a wide range of of pupils. And as you say, Tasha, some ideas that we share work with particular classes and they work with others. And that's one of the things that we have to try and test. And this is why one of the things we really want to encourage on our courses is that you have professional dialogue with your colleagues about what's working for your pupils in your school. Because some ideas might work um, with particular age groups, some might work with others, but somebody might have tried something and adapted it and tweaked it, and that actually works with uh, your students. So it is about that professional dialogue and having chats with each other. And this is what I love about the courses. We always learn so much from each other, and I learn from reading your comments. Uh, Because John came up with some great ideas in response to Tasha. So these are John's ideas, and I'm going to give John the credit for this. I'm just going to read some of these out, because I think they really help develop this idea of how can we get learning going with different classes. Um, So John says, a couple of things I've found useful in the past. He's teaching adults, uh, but he has taught teens. Use lollipop sticks. Yeah, lollipop stick. So every uh, pupil's name is put on a lollipop stick. They're put in a tub. And then when I pull it out, um, the person's name on the stick is asked to answer. That encourages everybody to be thinking and engaging and share their ideas. And it's about how I I value that that input. So that's a really lovely idea. What I like about lolly sticks as well, in addition to what John has said, is that I sometimes pull out a stick. But because I've been listening and I know that um, Aaron has got a particular point I think we all need to discuss... I might pull this out and it might say Grace, but instead I'm going to lie and I'm going to say, Aaron, what do you think? And actually I can still direct them while engaging everybody through the mechanism that I've got. So that's a lovely idea uh, from John there. Um, But as John says, it makes them aware that they will all be expected to answer at some point because you could put the stick away. There's all sorts of different ways of using it. And then John says, secondly, if the student gives a short or incomplete answer, He will always ask them another question. And it's that probing that we've been talking about to drill down until I'm satisfied, until he says they're satisfied with the answer. Um, After a while, they get given a hint, one word or a short answer. Finally, the rephrasing of the original question is vitally important to deter short answers. So there's some lovely ideas there from John. As John says, you know, this idea that um, I'm going to probe you is a really nice one. And it's been around for thousands of years, this, this questioning approach. So you can read about um, Socratic questioning, which is a particular approach that draws on this probing questioning and not giving of answers. So apparently Socrates taught by not giving answers, by just asking questions. Um, and Socrates, we are told, had students, I think it was Plato and Aristotle. So, you know, again, it was not bad as a teacher if they were the students that he helped develop their thinking of, but he would push them and use his questioning to find their learning boundary. And when he found their learning boundary, he would make them go away and think. Now we can plan for that as teachers in our different STEM subjects, and we can plan for where we find a learning boundary and then send our students off to engage in practical work or engage in some active activity that we've considered or some group work or some cognitively demanding work that's gonna help develop them at the point they're at, 
or we can scaffold them and support them at the point that they're at to help them then move their thinking further forward. So questioning as an approach, as John says, is really powerful for engaging them all. Um, so in terms of Tasha's questions, she says, with primary students, it's been going well. They're eager to share their ideas and comment on each other's. With teens, it's not going as well because despite giving thinking time and trying things like think, pair, share, when it comes to whole class or larger group sharing, there's silence. Um, and you have to nominate students to answer but get brief comments. Are there any tried and tested strategies for older children? Um, so in terms of, so in addition to the, the lovely ideas that John's got, I had a little bit of thinking for you, Tasha. I think one of the things for me, and it's true, isn't it? As we get older, and I think it reflects maybe the culture of learning we're in. I know myself, if I'm, you know, if I'm on a course or I, I, I'm asked to, to comment in public, we're, we're afraid, aren't we, sometimes that am I giving the right answer? So I've got to make my culture very safe that there is no right or wrong answer. And I, in my classroom, I don't ask for, is this right? What's, what's the right or wrong thinking? I do that. I say, what is your idea? What are you thinking? What are your thoughts? Because everybody has thoughts and is thinking. And so as long as I've got an activity or a question that makes them think, then everybody's contribution is valid. So I've got to make sure I ask the right type of question. And we've talked about that on the course. We've talked about rich questions and open questions that help challenge thinking and help me elicit all of those ideas. And that's where our intentional dialogue was. And it was about using the concept cartoons. What do you think? So it's not what's right, what's wrong, but what do you think? That's encouraging everybody, and that starts to change that culture. Uh, one of the things I do is I allocate roles. So when I've got my students working in groups or talking about a question, I might have somebody who is the explainer. So already they decide who's going to be the one that contributes to the whole class. Uh, I might have somebody who is the editor or the science journalist. I might have somebody who's the reporter. Um, so I, I, you know, when, when there's... The pupils are doing practical work. I came across some lovely ideas last week with some teachers. I might have somebody who's the measurer or the pourer for our younger children or somebody who is the uh, person who's going to analyse the results. We might have a data an analyst. And it might be then when I go to the whole class questioning, I might say, right, could I ask the explainer now, please, to contribute what your group's discussions were and explain that to the whole room? And that immediately gets more buy-in because they've had that chance to consolidate and gain confidence while talking with their group. And they're not talking on behalf of just themselves. They're talking on behalf of the others that they were with. And I'm asking for their thoughts. So allocating ro uh, roles works particularly well. Um, I sometimes, when my students are working in groups, I, as I say, I give them question stems to sometimes scaffold that discussion for them. So there might be some key questions that they need to have answered before we go back to the whole class. And then I might ask the reporter to report on which question they got to and what they'd learnt from their, from their group, from the discussions that they'd had about the questions. So allocating roles, scaffolding that classroom discussion with, with question stems helps. Um, getting pairs to talk together, as I said, it's very, I, I can't think of I ever ask a question for a response from somebody without I give them an opportunity to talk to somebody else. I know you've talked about thinking time and think pair share, and that's maybe not working, but maybe if one of them uh, is the nominated person to talk, so the person with the longest hair is the one who's going to feed back. So they make sure that they both talk and then that nominated person um, talks back. I do have a no opt out culture in my classroom because I can't teach best you know, and help them all learn if they're not contributing. So when I set up my classroom culture at the start, I do make sure that that no opt out is something that is there. If they're not confident, we can have a scaffold area or a drop in with me or a drop in with somebody who's got an idea, have a chat with them and then come back and talk to me. But it is going to be a no opt out culture. In terms of your question, Tasha, about how do I change the classroom culture? It takes time. It takes time and it takes resilience and it takes learning on our part of what is working well with our pupils. And it's about us all being, as it said in that dialogic teaching, that cumulative and supporting group who are there to listen and build on each other's ideas. And as they see that happening and they see that developing over time, and they see us responding to the evidence that we're eliciting, that actually we're not going to move on if you've not got it, or we are going to move on if you've understood it, or I am going to give you a scaffold this time because you need it, or I'm not going to give you a scaffold because you don't need it. If they see that responsiveness, then they're more likely to air their thinking, but it does take time from them. 
a nice way. And I do this, I, you know, I spend quite a bit of time when I meet my new classes. And for those of you who have classes, I know, um, you've, you know, like Tasha, you say that you work in a language school, so you might not have the same group of students for a whole year. I would still, whenever I meet a new group, spend a bit of time establishing our classroom culture and learning environment. My role, what I'm going to be here to do, and your role and your expectations. We can, if we meet a class for longer, we can set some uh, cooperative learning rules together. You know, what do you think are the three most important um, classroom rules that we should have to help learning? So to help learning. And then I get the groups to discuss the three most important things. As a group, then they share their three ideas. We then sift out duplicates and we produce our classroom charter for our culture for learning. And I'm always allowed to add my own three if I want. And I generally end up, when I do that, I end up with pupils coming up with about eight or nine very similar rules that I would have had anyway, but they have ownership of that learning environment because they generated them. With my classes, I used to make us sign, um, put our learning rules up for our classroom, and then we would all sign a pledge for learning. Um, and all of my pupils did that. So when at points... Uh, the classroom environment wasn't reflecting our classroom culture that we said we would stop. We would look at our classroom culture, our pledge for learning. We'd unpick what we weren't doing appropriately at the moment. We would decide we would change that behaviour and get back to appropriately learning and what we needed to be doing. So it takes time and resilience. Involving the pupils, they are key stakeholders in that classroom culture. But the really encouraging thing, Tasha, is that teachers who persist with this do change the culture. And the children come in and they will adapt to that teacher and they will behave in a way that, that, that shows progression. And that's where Inside the Black Box and all this research evidence came from. What were the teachers doing with assessment who were getting more out of their children than other teachers? The black box was the classroom. You know, Dylan and Paul and Chris back in the day, they went and had a look. They did a meta-analysis, a major analysis of all the research evidence. And they found that the teachers who got more out of their students students were doing the things that we look at on the course. They were getting this purposeful talk going, they were gathering data that influenced their thinking that they could respond to, and they moved their students on. And it is that culture that we talk about. So one idea at a time, slowly to develop your practice, Tasha, involving your stakeholders will help you take that forward. And as you say, some ideas work, some don't. Get that dialogue going with your peers in school and see what works for your students. So thank you, Tasha. Uh, really interesting questions. Thank you, John. Some fabulous ideas there that really help support Tasha and give us an idea how to move forward. So moving on, and it kind of links into what we were just uh, talking about there at the end with Tasha. Um, how can we support other teachers? So, you know, we get asked this question quite often, actually, on, on um, our online courses, because people have come and they've learned um, and they found that learning with others across across the platform has been really beneficial for their learning. How can they support the teachers they work with more locally? So Jean asks, um, dear educators, education is the principal pillar of all transformations in develop, developing and less developing countries. Um, having not enough or having poor assessment skills affects negatively the learning processes which pulls quality education down. Um, what are the pieces of advice that can help teachers who don't have enough or have poor assessment skills? So a really interesting question there, Jean. How can you work with others to help develop the efficacy, the, the effectiveness of assessment approaches for all of you? And when I say assessment, I don't mean testing, and I'm sure you don't, Jean. For me, assessment is about gathering that evidence that we respond to. It's that formative loop that we've looked at on the course. It's that acting collecting evidence, inferring, and then taking some action and closing that loop to respond for my pupils. In terms of the research evidence, Jean, um, you know, stuff that I've looked at when I've looked at uh, how to help teachers develop from professional development, it is hard to shift teachers' beliefs and practices. Uh, as teachers, we are very good at taking new ideas uh, but more often than not, we, we adapt the idea to our current belief system and use it in a way that necessarily, not necessarily shifts our thinking. So it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. One of the key things is to do it slowly and over time. So I know that Dylan and Chris do a lot of work on teacher learning groups and professional learning communities. And we take an idea. We need to understand 
where that idea comes from. So it's not about a sweetie shop approach of just taking an activity and doing it immediately. It's understanding the purposefulness and the meaningfulness of why that approach may be effective in the classroom. So I need to develop that conceptual knowledge about the idea. And then I need to go away and try it gather evidence on its effectiveness and evaluate that and evaluate it through professional dialogue with others. That way I am more likely to shift my beliefs and my practice slowly over time. So it's that dialogue, what's going to be the best activity to try with my students? Do I understand why this activity is an idea that's being discussed? Go away gathering the evidence, coming back and talking with professionals. Now, you've been doing that in a remote learning environment because you've been talking with each other, but we can get that going um, in learning environments in school. So it is about uh, gathering assessment evidence. Did the question do what I wanted it to do? What evidence did it elicit? Um, we can agree these questions together with colleagues before we go and try an activity. What questions should we be thinking about? And then we come back and have that professional dialogue with each other. Um, so it's very much about getting our minds on as well as our hands on in terms of the professional development approaches that we do. Uh, coaching is something in particular that is talked about as having a higher efficacy. And that is very much about raising our awareness about why we are doing what we're doing and how we become more effective at it. It's, it's becoming consciously competent is what the coaches talk about. You know, it's having an understanding about the purposefulness of what I'm doing. For me, a way to do this then over time is that professional dialogue. So I would be wanting to talk with my team and others about key concepts, um, progression and ideas that we want our students to be developing and the learning approaches that we use. I'd want my staff to be thinking about what assessments then are the effective way to gather this evidence and we talk about it. Then we'd work collaboratively to develop, analyse and moderate the, the activities that we use to elicit understanding about pupils learning and then importantly we'd evaluate those and adapt my practice so if I'm working with a colleague who's used a question that worked particularly well but mine didn't what is it that you did can I come and see what you did whilst you did that um, if we're analyzing test performance data my students have done really bad on this concept but yours have done really well can I come and find out how you taught that lesson you know what approaches did you use what activities did you use what questions did you use what evidence did you elicit from your pupils how did you respond to that and I'd be wanting as a, a leader or somebody supporting staff to develop, to have this professional dialogue going. And I know that Dylan has worked on a programme for, um, he worked on it for the Education Endowment Foundation, looking at how to embed um, formative assessment. And there are materials out there that will support you with that. I think that was shown to have a plus two month gain. So there's lots of um, additional resources that will help you, but it's getting that professional dialogue going and doing it slowly doing it slowly and adapting it in light of the evidence that you gather from your pupils. Uh, and as I say, continually reflecting and critically becoming consciously aware of what I'm doing in the classroom and the impact that's having, uh, and then reflecting on that so that I become more competent is a slow way to adapt it. So in terms of more reading, I would say go and have a look at the, the work that Dylan did on embedding formative assessment. I know Chris has written stuff on teacher learning communities and I would recommend in terms of looking at effective professional development for teachers to go and read work by either Thomas Gusky or work by Joyce and Showers. They look particularly at effective professional development for teachers. So I hope that helps, Jean. Um, I think it's interesting, isn't it? And I think I hope it comes across because we've written a suite of courses. This is the introduction to assessment for learning. This is a three week course. Uh, and we do say keep coming back to the course, keep coming back to the suite of courses because there's now three others that complement this course. So we've got the planning for learning then. We've got our um, feedback for learning and our differentiating for learning that all look at different aspects that um, originally come from the work that, that was inside the black box that looked at what those effective teachers were doing. There was five key areas that came out from that research. We've mentioned them, introduction for learning. And then they are huge areas where there's practice to be developed all the time. So it is about supporting yourself on that learning journey. So I hope you get the chance to engage with other courses. And if you can engage with them with, with peers from your school or from, I know in, in England, we have academy chains and get that dialogue going and picking out the things that are pertinent for you, then I think that's a really effective way to move forward that learning. So thank you as always for your questions. Um,
it's so interesting to see the things that resonate with you on the course and where we can support and develop your thinking further. Um, we do as educators still come back and look at, you know, particularly um, where you will get this video posted up. So if you want to put further questions or respond to ideas from this Q&A, please feel free to. Um, as I say, it's a pleasure and an honour to be able to work with you all and see the learning that you undertake. Um, you know, it's, 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 it takes a long time to embed this formative practice, but as Dylan says, I know at the close of the course, it is worth it. It is worth it. So thank you to Dylan and Chris, our key educators in this area. Thank you to you for all your, your contributions. Thanks to our mentors who support on the course. Um, thanks to the National STEM Learning Centre and particularly Matt, who's in the background there, technically supporting us all. Do go and look at the, the other suite of courses. Do come back if you finish the course and see what others have added to the threads. Um, particularly where you have thoughts or comments that you, you put. And don't forget the National STEM Learning Centre as well is a wealth of resources, um, particularly in terms of questions that can support hinge point questions. Um, I know that the, the Best Evidence in Science Teaching Project has got questions that are uploaded there that will help that focus particularly much on this course. So thanks as always. It's been a joy and a pleasure, and I look forward to hopefully engaging with more of you on other courses in the future.